Well, good evening, our nice intimate crowd here tonight. Thank you very much for coming out to this, the last of our, I don't think he's pulling that, our, um, is our drinking water risk panel discussions. My name is Kirsten Vanstone and I work with the Royal Canadian Institute, which I am virtually certain none of you have ever heard of, except for perhaps Dr. Schindler, as we gave him an award. Um, <laughs> the Royal Canadian Institute, though, is Canada's oldest scientific society. We've been around since 1849, and our goal was to originally, I can read you the original charter, was to, uh, with the encouragement and general advancement of the physical sciences, the arts, and manufactures. So that's language from 1849. Uh, we have blossomed into a group that talks about all different kinds of science, and our mandate is to bring that science and new technology to members of the public. So we are a public-facing organization. If you've heard of the Royal Society of Canada, that tends to be more about academics working together. We want to bring academics out to everybody. So we formed in 1849, and our founder was Sir Sanford Fleming, you might have heard of. He was the surveyor for the CPR, the first surveyor, and probably came through Calgary several times. But I don't think that the RCI itself has ever been out here. So we're very happy to be here and happy to be working in Calgary in this lovely venue. Um, we call ourselves now RCIS. We've attached the science to our name officially, so that's what we talk about. And we have about 600 members and a long tradition of bringing free science talks to the public. Uh, we're delighted tonight to partner with the David Suzuki Foundation. We've partnered with them for these three panel discussions. Our first one was in Ottawa back in April, where we talked a lot about water pollution and what happens when you use as your drinking water source the same place that you put what gets left over after you've drunk the water and done stuff to it. So uh, that was quite interesting. And then in Vancouver, we talked quite a bit about uh, land use stressing water supplies that are already challenged by drought. So what was the main issue here in Calgary? Well, not coming from here, uh, it seemed pretty easy to look at the glaciers and say that's the problem. So your water source is here perhaps dwindling, but then I learned more about the fact that groundwater is a source of drinking water for a lot of Alberta, and we've all been hearing quite a bit about groundwater in the news these days. So I was very curious to find out what our experts were going to talk about tonight. So what I'm going to do is stop talking now and see if my colleague Jay is around the corner. Jay Richland is coming here to us from Vancouver. He's the Western Manager and Acting Science Manager for the David Suzuki Foundation. He's going to introduce the speakers this evening and tell us a little bit more about what the David Suzuki Foundation is doing about water. So, thank you very much, Jay. My name is Jay Richland. I'm the Director General for Western Canada at the David Suzuki Foundation. And I am very happy to be here in Calgary. Thank you all for coming and welcome. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are meeting tonight on uh, First Nations territory, the territory of the people now known as Treaty 7, mainly Blackfoot, Nakoda, and Sutina people who in 1877 signed Treaty Number 7 with Queen Victoria nearly 140 years ago. The David Suzuki Foundation, not quite that old. Uh, we are, however, proud to be celebrating our 25th anniversary as an environmental charity in Canada. And our co-founder, Dr. David Suzuki, is simultaneously celebrating his 80th birthday. He was just uh, mere 60 years after that Treaty 7 was signed, David came into the world. And at the David Suzuki Foundation, we seek a world where people know and act on the understanding that we are an interdependent and interconnected part of nature as people. We are not separate from it, but we are interdependent with it. And then we act on that knowledge by seeking solutions for ways to live within the bounds of what nature can provide and what nature can withstand in terms of what we put back into it. Our Western Canada Department, which I lead, looks at issues of natural resource use, uh, habitat protection, species diversity and survival. We work with people from all walks of life, government, industry, scientists, academics, First Nations, and motivated, inspired community members to try to find solutions to the environmental challenges that we all, together, are facing in our society. It's my pleasure to be here tonight at this third uh, of what was originally termed the Water Talks uh, of the Royal Canadian Institute. Um, I'd like to thank the RCI for inviting me, uh, for asking the David Suzuki Foundation to partner with them. 
It has been an amazing uh, experience for us to learn and work with such a group of uh, dedicated science communicators. Uh, and of course, I'd like to thank the Royal Bank of Canada and their RBC Blue Water Project for uh, providing the funds that help make this evening possible. Water, uh, it connects us. It, it makes us alive. It gives us life and it inspires everything in humans from hope to terror, depending on what form it's coming at us in. Water truly is the stuff of life. At the David Suzuki Foundation, we have worked on issues around water from keeping it as habitat for fish, keeping toxic material out of it, uh, managing groundwater and surface water as if they are an interconnected whole, not two separate resources to be exploited at will, uh, and maintaining water flows that support what the ecosystem needs, not just what we as people need, but at the same time understanding the valuable and indispensable services that water and aquatic ecosystems provide to us as humans. And in all these things, we hope that with this understanding and with the direct engagement of our staff and our supporters and our volunteers and the experts who, who bring us their knowledge, we can help change the way that people act in their own lives, in their families and in their communities, and in our life as a nation. Because really, we are the people who help make those decisions. Our topic tonight is our drinking water at risk may have shocked the original inhabitants of this land. The very concept may have seemed ludicrous that the abundant water supplies in a place like Alberta could someday not be up to the task of watering us and our food, powering our industries, and taking care of the waste that we produce. But it is clear that that is a real and present possibility today. And that is why I am so thrilled to have our three presenters with us tonight. Uh, they will give us well-grounded scientific background on the risks facing the water we all depend on and some options for making things better uh, through science and through public policy and possibly even through our own behavior. The range of topics covered by Dr. David Schindler, Dr. Masaki Hayashi and Dr. Arlene Kwasniak will range from the global to the local and will hopefully give us all a number of things that we can do to help make water a long-lasting and sustainable resource in our communities. So, and even more important on that end, we will save time at the end of this evening for a conversation, a dialogue. Because while we rely on scientists and experts to bring us factual information, high-quality information that we can depend on and that we can use, it is up to all of us in society, as individuals, as members of families and communities, and as members of the body politic, to use this information, to try to understand it and figure out how we create the changes in ourselves and our communities that get it to be better, and hopefully someday achieve that amorphous and hard to define word, sustainable. On that note of the power of people taking action, I do want to point out, most of you probably saw in the lobby, uh, the people in uh, bright blue shirts. These folks are members, volunteers from Blue Dot YYC. They have joined over 10,000 volunteers across Canada who are working with the David Suzuki Foundation and the environmental law group EcoJustice to try and ensure that the right to a healthy environment are enshrined in the laws and ultimately the Constitution of Canada. This movement believes that clean air, healthy soil, and of course, clean water are fundamental rights that we should protect for ourselves and for our future generations. We hope that you will join us in trying to achieve this amazing outcome and see it as a way to make real some of the issues that we will hear about tonight. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers. I'll do so in the order that they will appear. I'll give brief bios and topics of each of them, and then we'll get into the evening. And we'll go through the conversations. Uh, we've got a fairly small group, so I would say that we can ask some clarifying questions after each speaker. But let's save time at the end for a more meaningful discussion so that we give time for each speaker to make their presentation, clarify any things that we didn't quite understand from their talks, and then we'll try to have a really good discussion. I think with this number of people, we could have a great conversation this evening. Our first speaker tonight is Dr. David Schindler. Dr. Schindler began his career as an assistant professor at Trent University. 
somewhere remarkably like the year I was born. In 1968, he was the founding director of the Experimental Lakes area, the ELA in northwestern Ontario, where ecosystem scale experiments with water and pollutants and long-term monitoring of lakes and streams have taken place for over 40 years. He has been a Killam Memorial Chair and Professor of Ecology at the University of Alberta since 1989. Dr. Schindler's science aims to underpin the environmental policy and has earned him numerous national and international awards, including the Gerhard Hertzberg Gold Medal, the first Stockholm Water Prize, the Volvo Environmental Prize, and the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement. Dr. Schindler will speak on the interaction of climate and water supplies. After Dr. Schindler, we will hear from Dr. Masaki Hayashi. Dr. Hayashi was born and grew up in a rural community in Japan. And after finishing a geology degree at the university in Tokyo, he went to Zambia in southern Africa and spent a volunteer, working, volunteer year working in a refugee camp to improve the groundwater wells in the camp. He completed a master's degree in hydrogeology and a doctoral degree at the University of Waterloo in Ontario and came to the University of Calgary in 1997, where he's now an associate professor in the Department of Geology and Geophysics. Among the many aspects of hydrology, he is particularly interested in how groundwater is replenished by snow and rain and how it is stored in rocks and soils and connected to creeks and wetlands. Dr. Hayashi will speak on the impact of climate change on groundwater. And then finally, Professor Arlene Kwasniak, prior to joining the University of Calgary in 2003, Arlene's law practice was at the Environmental Law Center in Edmonton for 11 years, the last two as their executive director. There, she developed keen interest in water law and policy, municipal law and legal policy, and legal issues concerning interjurisdictional management of water and ecosystem approaches, law and sustainability, and private conservancy instruments. Arlene won the Howard Tidswell Memorial Award for Teaching Excellence in 2010 and 11. So I am very thrilled to have these three speakers with us here tonight. And now, Dr. David Schindler on the interaction of climate and water supplies. Well, thank you for coming out to listen to us tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, last time I was in this part of Calgary was 22 months ago with uh, the Neil Young concert. And I must say the difference in drawing power of music and science is rather humbling. <laughs> the tiny slice of uh, the water problem and drinking water problem that I've chosen to talk about in 10 minutes tonight is for two reasons. Number one, it's what's being talked about in Paris this very week. And uh, I don't think the media is emphasizing enough how important this meeting is. We, uh, as you'll see, we've really passed the break point where we can expect to get by unscathed as a result of climate change. And the other reason is that 2015 was pretty much a poster child to the sort of years we can expect to see in the remainder of this century, only uh, they will probably get worse rather than better. A picture like this was a fairly common sight in British Columbia and in uh, the northern parts of, of the U.S. this year. And you in Calgary know all about it because you had air quality uh, as bad as, as some of the industrial sites in China for a good part of August and September from those very fires. You've probably all seen versions of this slide. Uh, 400 parts per million is the point where we were supposed to pass the magic two degree point. In fact, that two degree point is rather artificial anyhow. We passed the two degree point for the center of the continent, uh, the, in particularly the prairies, uh, about 15 years ago. And we're between two and three degrees throughout Alberta and Northwest Territories and how much the climate has warmed already. And as you can see, contrary to what some of the climate skeptics will tell you, there's very little evidence of any slowdown in climate warming. That point up in the corner there with the confidence limits is 2015. The reason there are confidence limits is we still have two months to calculate, the one ending today and the next month. 
but so far every month of this year, and uh, this in is two months old, has been warmer globally than any other month in any other year. The second was 2014, the blue line in the center of the pack here. It was the warmest year on record uh, when we began 2015. So as you can see, uh, it's, it's a nice test case so we can see where we're going. Coupled with that, we are always assured by the media and our politicians that we have lots of water in Canada. But it's like somebody with a thousand buckets out on their lawn. If you walk in, in there after it rains, it looks like they've got a lot of water. But in fact, uh, it's not the amount of water coming in that you're measuring there. It's the amount standing on the landscape. It's like having a big bank account with a very low interest rate. And that's exactly what we have in Canada. For our bigger waters, the rate of renewal is less than a percent a year for the most part. And that's because the precipitation that we have only slightly exceeds on average the evaporation and the transpiration in the terrestrial basins. In fact, in this area, there are long periods when it doesn't exceed it. It's actually less. Uh, and uh, because of that reason, we rely very heavily on the snowpacks of the Rockies. This is, if you calculate water as outflow, the amount of water that flows off the land area uh, per unit area, Canada doesn't rank up with uh, Brazil or Finland or the Russian Federation. Here are a few examples. We rank right down with China and the United States. And of course, we're always told that China and the United States are scarce of water. What this should tell us is that the reason we seem to have a lot of water is we're not fully utilizing it as humans. And we probably don't want to if we want to be able to continue to swim and fish and things like that. In other words, it's time we got careful with our water supplies. This is average annual runoff, and you can see that we lie right in that purple area at the bottom. That's less than 50 millimeters a year of runoff. Uh, and you can see a big part of the west has less than 100. And even if you include the far north where evaporation is low, it's less than 200. So to call a whole country water rich is pretty much a misnomer. In fact, the only reason we have a lot of lakes and rivers is uh, because of eastern Canada and particularly the Precambrian Shield area. Uh, you can also see over in central BC a blue area uh, that's almost as blue as the, this area, and that's the Okanagan Valley, which is the second area that I think uh, our water is imperiled. In that case, it's both fairly scarce, but it's also badly overused. Here's another way of showing the same thing. Uh, the size of rivers, the width of the yellow line is proportional to the flow of the rivers. And you can see that down in this area, you can hardly see any lines at all. In fact, those little lines that you see in proportion are the rivers that carry mountain water out here onto the prairies so that we have enough for cities like Calgary. And at some times, it's barely enough. That gray area at the bottom uh, has no net runoff. And of course, those of you who know your history probably recognize that that purple area on the last map and much of this gray and purple area here uh, are what was known as Palliser's Triangle because John Palliser deemed it not to have enough water to be capable of growing any crops. And in fact, it's the area that historian David Jones recounts in his history of the Dust Bowl as the Empire of Dust. And we're not far from the Empire of Dust today. I mentioned the flows from the Rockies, but the river that we are near right here begins at Bow Glacier. 
This picture of Bow Glacier on the top was taken in 1897 by a British chemist named John Colley, who claims, among other things, to have invented color photography. And the White Museum has a lot of his photos. Note that tree leaning into the glacier. Graham Pohl, for his hiking book, took the same picture in 2002, over 100 years later. That tree hasn't hit the ground yet, as you can see over here, but the glacier has, uh, has sure bit the dust. So uh, you can see how rapidly that glacier has moved in 100 years. Now there are people who tell you that those glacier flows are not important because they're only about 3% of the average annual flows. But that's true, but it's not telling it like it really is because in a dry year, in July and August, after the snowpacks have all melted and when it's warm enough that uh, evaporation exceeds precipitation, 50% of the flow in the Bow River where it leaves the mountains can be from melting glaciers. Not only that, but it's also the cold water which is what sustains the five species of salmonid fishes in the Bow River. And as some of you know, this past summer, many of those fisheries were closed because of heat stress. They were very near the lethal limits for these species and uh, uh, provincial biologists were afraid that fishing, which is very stressful as well, would put those fisheries uh, over the edge. Now on top of all of that, we know as of studies in the last 10 years or so that uh, the 20th century was an unusually wet century in the prairies. And that was done by David Sochin at the University of Regina who studied tree rings in various parts of the West. Uh, he calibrated them by comparing precipitation to tree ring with for the past century where we have good precipitation records and he found that tree ring width was a very good indicator, uh, somewhat around the 95 percentile correlation between tree ring width and how wet it was. And from that he was able to calculate past droughts. The red droughts shown here, the red bands, are droughts that lasted over a decade. and. Uh, the yellow bands are shorter droughts, but note the one, I can't quite see it here, but whoops, I didn't hit the right button here. Uh, the dirty 30s are, I think, the third bar from the end there. By comparison, the dirty 30s would have been one of the punier droughts on this map of the last three centuries. So if we return to anything like pre-20th century conditions, we're in for some pretty water scarce times. And of course, uh, water rights, water quality, none of that matters if you don't have water at all. Uh, a few years ago, Bill Donahue and I calculated these flows for the uh, various rivers from the prairies. We calculated them for May through August because those are the only months that had complete records uh, going back a century or so. And here you can see the trends in the piece and the old man, the old man being the red line, down quite a bit, about 40% plus. And the worst river we found was the Saskatchewan, South Saskatchewan, uh, which of course the bow is an important part. And you can see it's down over 80% from historical flows Part of the reason for that are the climate factors I've been talking about, but also close to 70% of the irrigation water drawn in, in Canada come from uh, the, Bow, the Bow River and the Old Man, which are tributaries to the Saskatchewan River. And another sign of what's happening, these are lakes without outflows. Uh, most of them in Saskatchewan or very far eastern Alberta. Uh, you can see the, the calibration here on the left side of, of two meters, uh, how much those have dropped, several meters. And of course, we've also seen the opposite extreme, which is also predicted by, uh, by climatologists, 
that when we do get water, it's going to be in extreme events. And this was two years ago, Cougar Creek, which is normally something you can jump over, maybe hitting one stone if you're my age, uh, to what this was. And of course, the recovery of that, uh, if you look at it driving by, it's not fish habitat. And uh, to put all of that in the perspective that seems to be the only one that many politicians understand, all of that stuff cost us a lot of money. Uh, the top list here is costs of droughts and billions of dollars for this year. Uh, 3.6 uh, was for the 2001 and 2002 drought on the prairies. Fighting the forest fires that were burning everywhere probably cost us over a billion dollars. Uh, these figures were, were done the end of September. And of course the floods, the Canmore Calgary flood alone is uh, six billion dollars and if you look at where people built afterward we can expect another one of these that'll be even more costly. And fisheries, we've had uh, declining fisheries up and down the coasts and as I mentioned no uh, uh, freshwater fishing for more than a month here. And yet our politicians seem to think that all of this pales by comparison to making money for the next 10 years ago. I think it's time we told these people to think about what's going to happen to the next generation or two, not just next, the next four years. Thank you. Have any uh, questions or clarification for Dr. Schindler? Okay, thanks very much. Dr. Uh, Masaki Hayashi, would you please come to the stage? Thanks very much, and he will be speaking to us on the impact of climate change on groundwater. All right, and this is you, I think. All right, well. Okay. Thank you, Jay, uh, for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, good evening. So uh, in the next few minutes, uh, I'm going to tell you about three things that we need to know about groundwater so that we can understand you know, how we can manage this resource. So just these three, three things, very simple. Groundwater is connected to rivers and wetlands. Uh, Dr. Schindler mentioned about that uh, uh, in his um, talk as well. And then, uh, so th this, this is just a picture of uh, some farmers' well uh, in just north of Calgary. And this is uh, uh, one of the springs in a place called the Glenbow Ranch uh, Provincial Park. So there is intimate connection between th what the farmers do uh, to this well, uh, i.e. pumping, and what happens to this spring, and an ecosystem that is dependent on the spring. The second, uh, thing is that uh, every watershed has groundwater underneath, and uh, we can see this groundwater as a bank account. And then the third uh, important thing is that uh, how much water we have does not depend on the size of the bank account, but it depends on how much revenue we get in this bank account. That kind of echoes what uh, Dr. Schindler was uh, commenting on. So I'll just start with... Um, this rhetorical question. So where do we find uh, groundwater? So, you know, some people talk about this uh, underground river that's gushing, you know, so using the sticks, you can detect the presence of this underground rivers. And there are such, you know, in some rare places, uh, such as uh, Malign Lake, you know, in Jasper National Park. But those are exceptions. In most cases, uh, groundwater actually doesn't flow in the underground river. Where it resides is this tiny pore spaces uh, in sand and gravel and other coarse grain materials. And uh, these are called the aquifers. So, uh, we, so we, we need to find these aquifers, but the aquifers are everywhere. So it, as long as you go down deep enough, you are bound to find, find the groundwater. So we just have to manage it properly. And in the local area around here, uh, in the region between Calgary and Edmonton, 
So the major aquifer uh, is in this fractured sandstone. So it's an ancient sand that kind of cemented as a, a rock. So when it has fractures, you have lots of groundwater in it. So this fractured sandstone aquifer is considered one of the most important aquifers in Canada. So um, we you know, think about you know, this groundwater. So how deep do you have to drill a well to hit a groundwater? doesn't have to be a really good one, just where you hit the groundwater. So we're not talking thousands of meters below. Now, typically, you hit groundwater around here within 10 meters, maybe you know, 50 meters. And so what that means is this water table basically mimics. So the sh shape of the water table, which is a blue line here, mimics the shape of uh, surface topography. And also, groundwater has to obey the law of gravity. So if you put those things together, so what you have is the groundwater starts from these areas under you know, some hills and uplands, and then the arrow pointing downward, meaning that the water originating from rain and snow is added to the water table. So that's called the groundwater recharge. And the other end of this groundwater flow line is where the groundwater pops up into uh, creeks, lakes, and wetlands. So that phenomenon is called the groundwater discharge. So this is one of the uh, spring again in the Glenbow uh, Ranch Provincial Park. And an important thing to consider is the scale. So typically, um, the farmers around here, uh, they don't drill too deep. You know, within you know, a few hundred feet, you can hit groundwater, good groundwater, so that's about 100 meter or less. So that vertical scale of 100 meter, uh, it's a relatively small depth, so that means the horizontal scale is relatively small. So this thing, the recharge-discharge pair that is called groundwater flow system, that has a scale of a few kilometers, maybe a few, up to a few tens of kilometers. So that's the scale we have to think about. So that's the scale of a small watersheds uh, for the groundwater management. So just to give you a local example again, so this is West Snows Creek, just north of Calgary, about 20, 20 minute drive from here. Uh, so you have this landscape with all the farms and you have a creek flowing through. And if you just look at the creek uh, bank, you see this uh, 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 bedrock uh, aquifers. And then, so this scale here is a few kilometers across. And then this, another scale bar is 100 meters. So that's how deep you know, the uh, groundwater flow system is. So you can see that the, all the important things are happening in a relatively small scale. So that's the scale we, we have to think about. So, Groundwater is a renewable resource, which is a bit different from oil and gas. Oil and gas, you find it, you exhaust it, and you walk to another place. But groundwater, we want to use it you know, renewably, leave it for next generation, next generation. So the water balance is the foundation of renewable resource management. So we have this recharge coming through, um, you know, fed by snow, melt, and rain. And we have a discharge feeding this uh, creeks, which is an important ecological element. And then we have some people pumping water. We got to use water. Um, so once you step out of the cities like uh, Calgary Red Deer, it's 100% groundwater dependent. So the area-wise, the groundwater dependent area uh, in Alberta is huge. And then, uh, so we have the uh, storage change on the other side of the equation. So when you have more recharge coming in than these other terms, you have a storage increase. So the water level goes up. So this is similar to bank account. So you and I all have a checking account. So once a month, maybe twice a month, the balance goes up because of the revenue. And then the rest of the month, the balance goes down. I'm not sure about you, but my checking account you know, kind of balances out on the long-term average. I don't go to a very, very deficit situation. Um, at the same time, I don't go very positive because my spending is dictated by my income. So really, in terms of what we have, how much we have, it's not the size of a bank account, but it's the revenue we receive. So that is groundwater recharge. 
So um, if you want to guess how much someone's making, you, know, you can look at how much this person is spending just to make a good guess. So detective work in hydrology, we do the same thing. For example, this is the flow in the West Nose Creek, just a little creek, I, sh I show you the photo. Uh, so it goes from May to uh, November, the end of October for each year, six years plot it. So there's lots of things happening in the spring and summer with the rain and all that. But by the time October rolls around, so there's a lot much happening. So there's no snow melt and there's not much rain. So really all the flow coming through creek is fed by this groundwater discharge. So that groundwater discharge sustains this ecosystem uh, around the creek. So that is a groundwater dependent ecosystem. So we just look at this uh, base flow in October, uh, year after year. So we started our observation in 2003. So you see that the base flow in October, the, the low flow fed by groundwater, uh, bounces up and down. So the, we hydrologists use this funny unit. So you got uh, the base uh, amount of flow, cubic meter per second, coming down the creek. So we divide it by the area of the watershed so we spread this water over the watershed, and we talk about millimeter of water on average in the watershed. So it runs around you know, 10 to 20 to 30 millimeter over the last 10 years. And then we have these wells, uh, monitoring wells in our watershed. So this is actually uh, run by volunteers, community volunteers. Uh, so this is one of the community wells. Uh, so the well water level goes up, up and down with the base flow. So more you know, saving we have in the bank account, we can spend more. So you get higher discharge when the groundwater level is high. And then uh, Environment Canada, before it was shut down by Paul Martin government in 1995, had a gauging station measuring the flow at, at the same place using the same method. So it was lots lower there. So, what's going on? So last 10 years, average was about 15 millimeter per year. So that's, you know, how much is coming through the creek spread over the watershed. And then the decade in 1980s, it was four millimeter per year. So recharge, the uh, revenue is balanced by expenditure. There are two kinds of expenditures. Uh, so the discharge, that's feeding the base flow and the pumping. And then we estimated the total pumping. There are about 1,000 wells uh, pumping from this watershed. So on average, that was a two to three millimeter per year. So that means the groundwater recharge, the revenue in the, uh, this period, the 82 to 95, was about six to seven millimeter per year. And then the past decade was much bigger, 17 to 18 millimeter per year. So two things, okay? One is that it's such a small amount. Like Dr. Schindler was saying, we have very tight balance between the precipitation and evaporation. So 10 millimeter is this much. So this, only this much is going into the ground. It's a precious resource. And the next point is that the recharge varies with weather. So the weather condition of the past 10 year was uh, wetter than the weather condition of 1980s. So that, that's why we get different values of recharge. So if you don't want to deplete your bank account and going into the deficit situation, you have to look at the monthly you know, bank statement and make sure well, it's going down. So I have to you know, just stop some spendings. So how do we do that for our groundwater resource? So we just have to monitor the water levels. So a number of years ago, funded by uh, Royal Bank Blue Water Project. We worked with the uh, county of Rocky View, which is the county surrounding Calgary, to organize a 40 or so community volunteers. These are mostly farmers and ranchers to uh, measure the water level in their wells, usually about once a month. So this is our website, and it's accessible uh, to all, all the public. So each pin represents those community volunteer wells. And then, so you, you got you know, 40 or so wells around the Calgary, and each one of them has this long-term record. So I'll just show you a couple of examples. So these are two wells, and then 
like you know, balance in your checking account, it goes up and down, goes up and down. But there was a period uh, in 2009, 2010, there's not a whole lot of revenue. So that was dry years. And this past year, 2015 was dry year too. So uh, this goes to show you again that the recharge is uh, dependent on the weather. So I'll just wrap up take home points, the three things. So the groundwater keeps rivers running when there's no rain or snow melt. If you look at the Bow River today, that water is fed by groundwater because there's not much snow melt happening, no, no glacier melt now, and not much rain. So really the groundwater is keeping the river going, and the fish need it, and we need it too. Uh, you know, Calgarians take drinking water from Bow River, so we need to feed it. And if we pump too much, you know, getting into this bank account business. So two things could happen. One is that creek flow will decrease, maybe it will dry up. And by doing so, you actually uh, deplete your neighbor's well. And by doing so, you might actually deplete your own well as well. And then the recharge, the revenue determines how much we have, not the capacity of the bucket. And then this recharge is sensitive to weather conditions, by that, you can kind of uh, speculate that the climate change might do something to recharge. So the groundwater um, may or may not be at risk, but really the, the most risky thing is to pump too much uh, groundwater. Thank you. Any questions or clarification before we start the final speaker? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Arlene Kwasniak will speak on what policies and laws should we adopt to protect our water. Thank you. Oh, good. Oh, here, let me. Uh, set me up there. Yes, I will. And this, uh, it's just right and left here. I think so. Yeah, I didn't use that one. Get that up there. There we go. Okay, thanks. Well, it's good to be here. Um, as uh, Jay said earlier, I'm. Uh, I'm a, a lawyer, I'm, I'm from the Faculty of Law at the University of Calgary and the Canadian Institute of Resources Law. So it's a little bit of a different perspective from the science perspective. And um, so I was asked to talk about climate change impacts on drinking water, the role of law and policy. And that is really such a huge topic because, because uh, there's just so many aspects to it. So it was kind of hard to find a place to kind of sail in and, and catch this topic. But uh, so I'm, I'm looking at it both broadly and narrowly at the same time. So what I'm going to talk about first is just briefly sum up some of the things you've already heard and maybe I'll add a couple of things about the nexus between uh, climate change and water quality. And then I'm going to look at, you know, what would an ideal law and policy framework, the laws of a, of a country, a, a province, a, a municipality, what would it look like um, if it were really climate change resilient, ready for climate change? And then I'm going to look at Alberta and see where we are, um, uh, uh, you know, next to that ideal. And then I want to just focus on one really um, small, but actually a huge part of the uh, water, drinking water and climate change nexus, and that has to do with uh, environmental flows, and I'll talk about those in just a minute. So climate change and drinking water, the nexus, you've heard a number of things. I just have a little list here I've been keeping. Uh, so we know with climate change, we have already and we'll continue to have uh, floods, heavier rainfall, more runoff and sediments, uh, nutrients in the water, um, more turbidity, so that you know we'll need uh, <clears throat> you know more water treatment, more filtration. So there's definitely will be lots of impacts on water quality. And then of course, droughts. We heard about the droughts, um, higher temperatures, more evaporation, uh, less uh, less water um, overall in the system, and and greater reliance on groundwater. We've heard about that. We heard about the. Uh, connection between groundwater and surface water and how all of that will be impacted by the change of, uh, in temperature and the change of, of uh, climate events. 
So, and, and all of this is going to affect our drinking water because it'll affect supply, and then also because it'll affect quality. Because, of course, with less water, you have less pollution assimilation, and, and of course, it'll affect our, uh, our aquatic ecosystems as well. And if we're going to uh, be tackling this, you know, ahead of the catastrophe, which we really should be doing, we have to involve the government on, uh, on all levels. So the federal government, which uh, has jurisdiction over um, fisheries, wherever they, uh, where, wherever they occur in Canada, uh, and uh, navigation and, and toxic substances. The provincial government, um, which has the main regulatory power over uh, the things that will be affected with respect to water and climate change, like water rights, which we'll be talking about, and, and, and the major, it's the major regulator of land uses. And of course, uh, municipal governments as well, because municipalities regulate water treatment uh, for, municipal, for municipalities, at least for urban use, and then and water supply. Uh, and then also land uses and development. So what would be an ideal uh, legal system that was climate change ready, climate change resilient, so um, as it comes, it will be able to deal with, deal with it? Well, one of the things is it would have to be, there would have to be adaptive, fair, and flexible water rights. The water rights are just the rights that um, companies, people, agriculture, irrigation districts, municipalities have, which they get from the government to, uh, to take water out of a water course or to take wa groundwater and to use it for some purpose that's uh, recognized in, in legislation. So these are our water rights. But if we're, but if we're, if we're going to be uh, dealing with uh, you know, ecological systems and big, ch and big changes in them and, and climate change and big changes, they need to be flexible. There has to be a point where government has to be able to say, okay, you know, we have, we have a real problem here. We're going to have to you know, cut everybody down a bit. We're going to have to share the water that's available and keep enough in there for the system. And it, and I, and it has to be fair as well. I mean, I think an ideal system, you would, you would, if you have to cut people off, you would do it equally, or you would have some priority of uses to make sure that uh, the, the uses that really, really need to be met will be met. Another thing is that environmental flows would be protected in this, um, in this ideal system. Now, an environmental flow is the, uh, or sometimes I call that an in-stream flow need, is the amount of water the, uh, that uh, the, the, the amount and quantity and flow of water that's required in a water course, or it uh, could be some a body of water, to um, to 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 sustain the aquatic ecosystem. Um, and why do we need to have water in our water courses? Why do we need to have protected environmental flow? Well, there's lots of reasons, but I just have a list of them here. Is one I mentioned is pollution assimilation. If you if you don't have enough water there, you're not going to assimilate. Uh, as much pollution and you won't have the same water quality. Lower flows, you get higher temperature and, and effects on fish mortality. Higher temperatures can uh, promote algal blooms and, um, and, and, and toxic algae. Uh, and of course, you need flows to maintain aquatic and riparian ecosystems and all the other things we enjoy like recreational activities and, and aesthetics. You need the flows to flush sediments and maintain channel integrity, which is, is going to be more and more important with uh, major climate events and floods. You need to have your channel, channel integrity. Uh, groundwater recharge, we just heard about that. Um, you, need, you need to have uh, flows to, 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 to uh, recharge the groundwater, navigation. And then, of course, having water in our system is inextricably tied to water supply and economics. You can't have water, economic water use without environmental flows and flows in the, in the water course. Another thing an ideal system would have would be that water conservation would be incorporated right in it. Somehow the right to use water would also, you know, take with it the right to conserve it and not to waste it. Also, it would, it would be a, a system, a water uh, framework that ba was based on watershed planning and watershed management. It would have a recognition that uh, government can't do it all alone. Everyone affects the watershed. And in order to 
uh, properly manage it, it has to be taken as a responsibility of everyone. And you'd also have to have integrated and interjurisdictional management because, uh, uh, because water doesn't exist in isolation. It crosses jurisdictions, and it's not like you can have one department in government that, that you know, has full control over it. Groundwater, surface water would be conjunctively managed. We just heard about that um, and, and, and the importance of that. And another thing which is you know, being recognized in, in some jurisdictions is that we, we shouldn't just think about you know, fresh water from natural sources like rivers and lakes and, and, and groundwater as our only source of water. We have to think more broadly and have other sources of water like reclaimed water, um, maybe produced water, the water that the oil and gas industry produces in carrying out their, uh, their, their activities, rainwater harvesting, all of these should be seen as part of the, the, water, um, uh, the, wa the water source, uh, our water supply in the ideal system. Well, what do we have? Do, is our, do we have that kind of resilient system? So let's just look at some of these things. I'm going to be talking about the first two in a little bit of detail, whether our water rights system and our, our water management system is adaptive. Uh, fair and flexible in a second, and the environmental flows. But the other ones, I know there's really not much time right now, and if anyone has questions they want to raise with respect to these after, I'm really happy to talk to you. And I'll just say very quickly, water conservation is not very well incorporated into our water rights systems. In fact, our, our, our water rights systems encourage water use and not conservation. Although we've been making some steps towards watershed management, we have really a long, long way to go, and, and, and with respect to all the other matters that are mentioned in that bullet. Groundwater and surface water are managed separately. You know, there is science going on that you know, shows us that the, you know, the connections between groundwater and surface water, but as a matter of fact, they're managed. They aren't managed together. Uh, other sources become uh, part of our water supply. Well, we're going very slowly in that regard, um, and, and you know, it's uh, there's a lot of resistance to um, seeing supplies of water other than the uh, the natural supplies as part of our water supply. But what I wanted to focus on is uh, whether our system is adaptive and and are our environmental flows protected, and that just takes uh, to talk about whether our water rights system, and that's again, it's the right of people to take water from a water source and use it for some purpose, is uh, adaptive and flexible. Um, I can say, I can just conclude right now that no, it is not. In fact, it's very rigid and, and, and not really fair at all because fairness was never really thought to be a part of it because it wasn't an issue when our water rights system was um, contrived back, uh, back in the 1800s. And the way it works, and this is Water Law 101 in two minutes, which is uh, the Crown, the government, you know, claims itself to be the owner of all water in the province, and then it gives people, companies, irrigation districts, municipalities, the right to use that water um, in accordance with legislation. And the main legislation that we have now is the Water Act, and, and, and then if someone wants to get a water right to use water, they have to apply for it to the government, and then the government will issue a license or not. So, it, so the right to, to divert the water is given by the government. And the way this works, though, is because this uh, system was devised back in the 1800s when this kind of water right system was uh, common in the Western United States, is that, uh, if, is that the older the water license the, uh, the better right that the holder of that water license has to water in times of shortage. And these water licenses run with the land. And so here's just an example. I have a, a water source here, and we have like three water licenses. Let's say Joe, we have Joe here with 100 acre feet of water. Let's say that license dates back to 1900. Obviously, it's not Joe, but it, it ran with the land. Um, and then Sally has one for 50 acre feet of water per year um, uh, from 1946, and Mary from 1988. Well, the way our water rights system works out, if, if there is a water shortage, meaning there's really not enough water to go around because there's a drought, for example, 
then that means that Joel gets the right to his entire um, allocation before anyone else gets a right to any. Now, so it, it's really just, it's not fair because uh, it does, you don't look at the purpose, you don't look at who really needs it, who's wasting it, or anything like that. It's just, it's just set up because of, of this first-in-time, first-in-right system. Very common in the United States as well, Western United States. So we've, we've been giving out water rights in the, in the province since uh, 1894. And uh, so now in some parts of the province are, are drier than others. And we've heard a lot about uh, the South Saskatchewan River Basin and the issues we have with water, uh, with, with sometimes having with water, water scarcity out here. And, uh, and in fact, our water rights, the water allocations, the licenses, are over allocated um, or fully allocated in most of the South Saskatchewan Basin. And so that, that basin is that, uh, you see in the, in the larger thing here, I'm not sure this works, I won't bother with that, but you can see it's, the, it, it's roughly from Red Deer South. Um, and, 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 and what it means is that it's fully or over allocated is that you know, in a time of shortage, that first in time, first in right will kick in and then the, the, the oldest license will get, can get everything before any more junior license can get anything. And this, has, uh, this is really unfortunate because this has led government um, to say that managing the South Saskatchewan River Basin at this time to meet in-stream flow needs, you know, the amount of water that we need to keep those environmental flows to sustain riverine processes and associated ecosystems over the long term is judged not possible because of existing allocations. Now, the first time I heard that, I thought, well, how could this be so since the government owns the water that it could have, you know, given out the water rights in such a way that can't even take care of the system. But it has done that, and, and, and it's because of that that we, we have to really recognize that this is, that, that, re that replenishing in-stream flows is really a private and a public business. It's a activity, because we have to have the cooperation of, of, the, of, the, of the public and the private and the government uh, in order to do that, because there are all these private rights out there. And climate change will, of course, exacerbate the in-stream flow issues. So let's look at our Water Act to see how close we come to that, uh, uh, that ideal water management framework that is climate change resilient. Well, so what would happen if, we, if the government wanted to do something and said, you know, I think we should change these water rights. We should really try to buy some of these back. Well, surprisingly, there is no power to expropriate a water license under the Water, water Act. Now, this, this is surprising because, of course, the government can expropriate your land in the public interest, but there is no right to expropriate a water license. They are very, very secure, so they're, they're really not flexible. There's no authority to amend a license in the public interest. And this is, this is uh, you know, somewhat unique to Alberta and Canada, um, you can do that in Saskatchewan, for example, but you can't do that here. And there's only really very limited um, authority to cancel a license, even for the lack of use of it. There are a number of tools that the Water Act does give. In fact, when the Water Act came out and um, when it was declared into force in 1999, it was pretty much hailed as you know, a really forward-looking act with lots and lots of tools. But one of the problems was that these, the use of these tools is really highly discretionary, and, and so far, at least, uh, our government hasn't um, you know, uh, really taken that ball and, 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 and began to run with it. So there are some things it can do. It can put conditions on licenses, and there are some, but, but they really alone won't um, restore our environmental flows. There are some other, other things here, and I'm really not going to get into them because I only have about another minute or so to talk, I think. Um, but let me, just, let me just say that right now, the way things are, uh, you know, unless the government were to really seize, seize the tools in the Water Act and, and use them very aggressively, um, we're, we're not going to get very far on restoring and protecting our environmental flows. And, and I'm not the only one who thinks these, this should be done. This is just a, a quote from a minister's advisory committee from 2009. So this is the last government 
that uh, the conservative government that, that you know, got this advisory committee together and uh, the first recommendation was to, was to establish protected water for the purpose of protecting the environment and aquatic e ecosystems in all major river basins in the province. The government should not allocate water for consumptive uses where allocations would reduce protected water. That's like, that's like a protected environmental flow, so no one can, can, can use that water below the stipulated levels. Where existing licenses prevent the stipulated levels of protected water from being met, the government should establish and implement a plan to achieve protection for the stipulated levels within a reasonable period. Okay, so this, this was a, a really high-level high advisory committee that made this recommendation. So wh what can Alberta do to become an environmental flow uh, climate change leader in Canada? We know that Alberta is becoming, with the new government, is, is, you know, is becoming a, a climate change leader in some ways. And I think this is really a next step for it. And I would really be very happy if it took this next step. But the first thing it needs to do is to develop an environmental flow policy. It needs to you know, say, yes, yes, we really do need to protect water and you know we need a plan. We need a plan and we need a policy and this is how we're going to do it. And then the next thing it has to do, well, along with this, it has to determine what are the actual in-stream flow needs um, throughout the province. And then it would have to recognize that the protection requires both you know, public and private commitments and actions, like I mentioned before. And then the next thing it should do, just like the advisory committee said it should do, is actually protect that water. You know, protects it by licensing it is one way. It could, it could do so like in places like in the, uh, in the north where we're not over allocated, even in the Athabasca Basin where we know we're going to have real water issues in the future um, because of, of the development there, the oil and gas development in particular. There is the opportunity to actually protect the water, put a license on it so um, you know, water couldn't be allocated in a way that would um, uh, put uh, environmental flows at risk. But where it's not available, government could do things like it could uh, use this water transfer system that, that we have in the province where water licenses can be transferred from one use to another use um, to, to transfer them from uh, you know, consumptive uses to uh, protective uses, to environmental flow protection uses. Um, there, is, there is provision in the Water Act for Crown licenses to hold, uh, hold, hold in-stream flow licenses, and arguably, in some circumstances, private entities could do the same, like things like water trusts. Another thing it could do is, ideally, would be to buy out licenses. This is what happened in Australia. An Australia government, when it decided to, uh, the various governments, in Australia decided to protect environmental flows, they didn't use the transfer system. Sometimes they did, but mainly what they did is they just bought out licenses because they didn't want to artificially seem to be manipulating the water market. So, but we don't have that power right now just to buy out licenses uh, except through the transfer system um, because there's no water to, no power to expropriate. Uh, so that would require law reform. And also, not, also another thing I think that we really do have to just, just, just do is figure out, you know, look at our water allocation system and, and try to make it fair. And, you know, and, and really think about if when, it, when push comes to shove and we, we're in a really water scarce uh, situation, you know, how, how should we divvy up the water? And get that, get that system in place now, you know, before it happens. And, and, and so in a time when, because when this happened, you know, everyone's going to be rebelling. So it would be, be much easier just to have all that in place right now. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Any clarifying questions for Arlene? Yes, we've got one in the back here. Go ahead. Yes, we do. Since 1999, uh, under the Water Act, it's now possible for people to sell their water license um, to someone else, and there is a water market. It's 
probably a lot more active than one might think. Um, there are lawyers out there who just practice in water, water, water transfers. It's, it's highly regulated, so it's, it's, not, it's not an easy process to go through, but yes, there is a water market. There's no limit on the profit, it's whatever the market will bear. So if a person you know, has a, an older water right, a, se or a senior water right, it can be a very valuable asset to that person. And if they, if they uh, uh, make it through the regulatory process, they can sell that water right to a willing buyer at whatever profit they can get. And does the seniority transfer with the right at that point? Absolutely. And that's, that's what makes that what that's what makes it uh, yeah that's what having a water right is is such a valuable thing <laughs> yes it's seniority tra transfers as well so we're going to um, yep. lift the screen please and uh, we'll ask our panelists to come up there's a cleverly hidden uh, set of chairs and a table with some water back here oh, water. and <laughs> yes water yes well, there will be water for all of us who have been trying to talk some tonight uh, I encourage anybody who would like to move down closer to do so but if you're comfortable where you are that's fine too um, I've got a few feeder questions but uh, we'd like to also take questions from you all uh, and I'd also like to offer you all the chance to participate in the answers I think uh, the David Suzuki Foundation has had a lot of good experience with the idea that often the experts are in the room and they're not the experts that you think they are. So we'll get the conversation going. Uh, we've got a microphone for questions. And if any of you think you have some ideas to contribute to the answers as well, I, I'd really encourage you to do that. Many of the challenges with water and drinkable water in particular in Alberta and in Canada uh, show up on First Nations in their communities and, and in their um, ability or not to get clean, safe drinking water. I'm wondering if the panelists or, or any of our audience members have any commentary on what can and should be done about that situation. And David, I would start with you. Yeah, I have some experience with it. I chair the board of a small foundation called the Safe Drinking Water Foundation, which specializes in helping First Nations uh, solve bad water supplies. Uh, unfortunately, it's very small. It has one engineer, and it typically takes about three years for each First Nation. But uh, it starts with some very hopeless cases, cases that you couldn't treat the water in any possible way without some of the special apparatus that they've invented. Uh, they have a system that is reverse osmosis plus. Typical reverse osmosis equipment as installed by Indian and Northern Affairs under its various names usually doesn't work in some of these because there's so much dissolved organic matter in the water that there's more time spent back flushing the membranes than, than uh, uh, preparing drinking water. So uh, our engineer, Hans Peterson, has devised a biological pre-filter which breaks down these huge organic molecules to things that can be handled by an ordinary membrane system. And he also goes to Europe every few years and looks at the latest and greatest membranes. The biggest uh, drinking water reverse osmosis system in Canada when I looked about two years ago was Saddle Lake right here in Alberta where 7,000 people use reverse osmosis water uh, from a very bad water supply, huge blue-green algal bloom to the uh, point where in midsummer the blooms decay on the surface of the lake and even lose all their chlorophyll so the surfaces are white and uh, there's almost zero oxygen in the water and lots of other bad things that you wouldn't want to drink. But by the time it's done, uh, it's practically like drinking distilled water. Minerals have to be added back. And the best thing, and I think sh what should make it a model for other First Nations, is that part of this process is training the First Nations people to operate it and diagnose the problems. And there are about seven First Nations now that uh, that safe drinking water has has helped to provide their own drinking water, and they've 
all told Indian and Northern Affairs, just go away. We don't want you and we don't need you here anymore. Anyone else? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, one, of, one of the problems is, is this on? Yes, okay. you're, you're coming through clearly. Very yes. good microphone. Usually there's feedback. Here. One of the problems is, is, is a, from a legal perspective, is a jurisdictional one. Um, mm -hmm. uh, First Nation reserves are federal land, technically, that's owned by the federal government. And so one would think that there would be basically federal jurisdiction over drinking water and, and, and that the federal government would do more um, to, to help out the situation. But the prob one of the problems is uh, the province, at least in Alberta, you know, claims that it owns the water on First Nation reserves. And, and, and there's, there's this really, w both the federal government and, and the province, I think, are, are really shy you know, to get in each other's face too much. And they're also, they don't really want to take responsibility. And then, of course, there's the First Nations management issues as well. But in the end, what hap what's happening is that the water quality issues really aren't being addressed that well, except by engineers and scientists. And, and uh, in fact, there has, there has been a lawsuit, there is a lawsuit going on right now um, where the, the federal government's being sued to, uh, to step forward uh, to help get, get the drinking water um, uh, improved on, on First Nations reserves because it's, it's just, it's abominable. So, you know, and, some, and something really needs to be done. The example that you mentioned is exactly the one at Saddle Lake. Uh, when we started there, I had an elder take me on a tour of the watershed, and uh, there was a little inflow stream about a foot wide and maybe three inches deep. And uh, he talked about how when he was a child, they used to canoe up to a chain of lakes upstream. And you could, in fact, see the old uh, uh, river benches that uh, showed, if you knew what you were looking at, exactly what he said. All of the water supply originates outside on provincial lands, and the groundwater usage was not uh, regulated, so it just dried up the aquifers that fed this little river that, that, that fed Saddle Lake, their main water supply. Anybody from the audience with a comment to add to this or, or an additional question about the, uh, the topic that is on right at the moment? Yes, there's the microphone coming to you there. So what is the, the reason for this in-stream in Saddle Lake that it has been diminished so much? Is that climate change or is it usage by industry or a combination of? It's usage by... Uh, by ranchers and farmers upstream in the basin, and also climate change. There seems to be a lot of inter-jurisdictional issues between the federal government, provincial and municipal, when it comes down to land use development, and probably any kind of compliance and enforcement and even though there have been attempts to bring all three parties together to discuss some kind of framework to be able to deal with these issues, there's a great reluctance. So until we reach that stage, I think that we're going to be saddled with one jurisdiction passing it off to another and then nothing getting really done. Can you comment? Sounds about right. <laughs> the weird thing is, if you take it down to the analysis level, scientists on all those jurisdictions get along fine. They'll come up with unanimous regulations and pass them upstairs. It's when you get to the bureaucracies <coughs> that you run into problems. And I, I would just add, add to that that often um, the in environmental sectors and industry are often right on side as well. <laughs> Um, and it's, it's just when you get to the bureaucracy at the government level that, that you have issues. But I have a lot of hope. I have a lot of hope uh, uh, in, in, in the new governments that we have that I think we're going to hopefully see a lot more cooperation 
and common goals. Or do you think it's the politicians who only can see the short term and not the long term because they want that pension and get reelected? I, well, I think it's politicians. I think it's uh, it's ideology is is basically what it is, uh, and we just have to get beyond that ide ideology. The province being very worried about giving up any powers or authority to the federal government. Uh, but then it's the federal government to the provinces has changed so much over the last few years. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, um, the, uh, uh, the federal government w took a, a fairly, had a fairly large role in, in, in the province in environmental assessment and fisheries management and navigation. And then the last, the last government, you know, just tried to s give it all back to the provinces. So I don't know what's going to happen in the future. But the kind of thing you, you're talking about, you know, how we really need to interjurisdictionally manage um, is, 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 is really difficult. I think we've tackled it somewhat in Alberta with the Alberta Land Stewardship Act, so we have a tool to uh, manage the province, the provincial interests under one act, but we don't have uh, the role for the federal government in there or a clear role for First Nations. As a federal scientist for 22 years, uh, I th think uh, what Arlene says is right on. Everybody wants to balance budgets, so everybody thinks the only way to do that is to cut expenses. If you cut departments, the first ones to go are always environmental departments. So if you can cut your responsibilities for something, it's easy to cut away the budgets. As a scientist with fisheries and oceans, uh, we were told, oh, no, no, the Constitution, no uh, corrections in 1996, gave powers to the provinces to manage their waters. Therefore, we're going to put all our resources onto cod and salmon and the coasts. In fact, the provinces didn't step up, step up to the plate by, by uh, replacing the federal research capacity. So while they huff and puff about duplication of effort, in fact, both groups have pulled out. We have nobody minding the water store. Um, Masaki, I wanted to know if you had any comments on specifically what is missing from the way that we treat groundwater uh, in, in the context of Alberta, we'll start with, or, or in Canada more broadly. Yeah, this province uh, uses, um, the, this is a 60 years old uh, method to uh, allocate the license. Um, so wh what happens is, okay, um, you know, someone uh, in, in a farm wants to put in a new well. Uh, I guess it probably applies for more of a bigger things. Uh, let's say municipality of, uh, you know, thousand population wants to put in uh, a water well. Um, so the, uh, the you would have to apply for the license to Alberta government, and then so the, what the uh, developer needs to demonstrate I is this: so you drill a well and then pump it for two hours, and then uh, gather the data and use that data to project what is going to happen in 20 years. And uh, uh, so one, one assumption, so th th this has been uh, used by engineers and then license managers. So one assumption in this calculation is that this aquifer has an infinite extent. So the aquifer covers the entire planet. So, so that's the basis for this calculation. And this method is continue to be used, allocate the water license. Therefore, there are a lot of cases of over overuse because this license is licensed, assuming infinite aquifer. So that's probably the critically missing in Alberta. Basing your resource extraction on an assumption of infinity. I think we can call that a problem. <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted to open up for any questions at all from the, the audience. Yes, right here in the front. Uh, so one of the things, of course, places like California and the southeast, uh, southwest U.S. have done is they dam and try to collect every single big flow and they have a lot of inner basin transfer. Do you think that uh, there's any expectation that Alberta will try that, uh, change their regulations and 
dry interbasin transfer and, big, and a lot of dams to store water in order to cover these pro projected droughts. That crops up every few years. And all of the plans, if you look at old maps, the maps are there of how to divert the Peace River. And uh, I used to get a half dozen letters a year. People say, we don't have a water problem in Calgary. We'll just divert the Peace River. They haven't looked into the cost. They haven't looked into the ecological costs of doing that. Best to leave the rivers where they are. Move the people in the industry to where the water is. Don't try and do vice versa. And if you look in depth at what's been down in, in the southeastern or southwestern U.S. with uh, the biggest fisheries declines and other declines in organisms anywhere, and they're still in water problems, you'll see why. Anyone else have a comment on that? Yeah, Arlene. I haven't heard anything about um, interbasin transfers. <coughs> On What's that? Are they allowed? No, under our legislation, our legislation prohibits interbasin transfers except for, you know, a couple of like municipal water exceptions um, without a special act of legislature. Uh, and there has, there is one. In fact, it was, it's, it's curiously, it was the South Saskatchewan, no, it was, yeah, the South Saskatchewan Basin going, uh, yeah, going into the Red Deer Basin. It seems like it's odd, odd that it would go that way. But there was a special act of legislature to permit that to happen. And I didn't even know it was happening at the time. I was with the Environmental Law Center, and usually we knew mm, this I, stuff. I think it was the Red Deer in, <laughs> into the, into the uh, uh, bow. Was it Red Deer into the bow? Okay, what it... But it, it, it passed very quickly, so it's prohibited. But if you have a majority, it can go pretty but, quickly. You know, and by that logic, you ought to, be, ought to be able to divert the South Saskatchewan into the Nelson, and it's part of the same, oh. one, or into the Winnipeg or the Red. So oh. or into the Missouri. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now I'm getting nervous. These guys are coming up with crazy ideas. Yes. Hi, um, I have a question uh, regarding. Uh, the Council of Canadians and what they've uh, put forward as a national policy on water. So when we keep hearing about water crises and about the, uh, you know, companies trying to buy aquifers in BC or in Elora, and uh, it just looks like we go from crisis to crisis to crisis. Um, when we look at something like a national policy on water, is that a direction we could be advocating for? And is what the Council of Canadians suggests uh, realistic? Are you talking about uh, water exports, or? Well, that that's that's definitely part of it. Um, part of it is that water is a human right. Oh, to yeah, yeah. I mean, inherent in that question is water resource. Is it a right? Is it a commodity? You know, all of those big questions. But just the the national policy on water that's been promoted by the uh, Council of Canadians. Well, at I'm one not point, sure if you're familiar with it, and if it's. You at know. one point, it was actually promoted by the federal government. That's why we had the Pierce Commission in the 1980s. And it was actually tabled. And that uh, the legislation died on the floor when an election was declared. And I've forgotten which government transferred to which, but was never picked up after the election. Can the federal government create a national water policy under the current jurisdictional uh, division of powers that would be meaningful? I think it would be easier than a, than a climate plan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> a, policy, a policy is a policy. It's not it's law not anyway. And, yeah. and, the, and the federal government could certainly give that kind of leadership and guidance to the, to the provinces. But I, 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 I always have trouble with, you know, I mean, I think, yeah, water should be a human right of some sort. And and it and it is. I think it should be an ecological right as well. Um, but I don't. I don't personally or philosophically, theoretically, see the the real issue with it having a price and being a a, a human right as well. Um, that's one thing that I don't really quite understand about the Council of Canadians' point of view. I think their view is that uh, if everybody is is uh, 
starve for water, those with the most money would get it. And if they live in California, if we assume that we can export it as well, the Californians will take as much water as they want. In fact, uh, they do anyhow via the Columbia. Uh, if you think all of that uh, water that was exported this year was just to generate hydro needs, uh, you need to get a new doctor. But, but I think it's more like, you know, food can be a human right, the right to food, food, which it is in many places, but it doesn't mean that food is not also a commodity. Um, and, you know, but putting a price on water also helps to conserve it. And, 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 and as a matter of fact, we buy and sell water all the time, even though we might talk this story about how we're only selling water rights or the right to use. But um, I think when you really think it through, uh, we're, we're selling the water. And I, but I think what we really need is a really very firm and highly regulated transfer system and everything to make sure that if it ever came to the point where, uh, you know, the U.S. is coming out here and trying to buy our water, that they have, um, uh, you know, a really steep regulatory mountain to climb in order to, to get it. Oh, we, they have mechanisms to get it. I mean, they take a good part of our hydro, leave us with all the environmental damage, and give us a bit of money for it. That happens from B.C. to Newfoundland and Quebec. Same with crops. Every, every truckload of grain that we ship out is virtual water. So we're doing it. We're transferring the water right now. Um, it's, 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 in, it's on the market. I just think we really have to acknowledge that and and uh, you know and, and make sure that we're 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 doing it right and we and we don't lose control of it. Do you have anything to add, Saki? No? Okay. Another question from the floor, right here. Yeah. Hi. Thank you very much. This is really helpful. Um, this is a really local and time-bound question. There's currently uh, quite a large clear cut going on just west of the city of Calgary in the foothills in the Ghost River watershed. Um, I don't know if you are aware of it. Uh, the local people out there have been trying really, really hard for a year and a half to stop it. It was a 20-year so-called sustainable cut reduced by the previous government to now two years. And so it's proceeding extremely rapidly. There are a lot of people who live out in the Ghost Valley and can hear the cutting from inside their houses. And I think I had a meeting with them on Sunday. Well, not, I didn't have the meeting. I went to one of their meetings, and they are completely exhausted and at their wit's end of what else they might do. I wondered if you have any suggestions. I'd like, I, I don't understand why the city of Calgary isn't more alarmed at uh, this important part of the watershed. The ghost provides about 30 percent, I think, of the flow to the bow, and uh, it's quite a large area. It has wetlands everywhere that the residents have basically protected now by taking Spray Lakes people out there saying, here they are, this is where the swans are. Um, this is where wet places are, and then they say, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll protect that, and we'll protect that, and so uh, that's been going on for about a year and a half, but now the cutting is happening very, very fast. So if there's anybody in the audience interested in getting involved in some of the work that's going on to protect it, I'd love to talk to you, but if you have any advice, I don't know. <laughs> or is it just gone? So th there, well, maybe... Would any of the research that Aldous Sillins is doing at the University of Alberta be appropriate for that? Because he's looking at a lot of, of course, you know, flow rates from cut and uncut watersheds. I, I really don't know. He's the only person I know that has actually done any experimental work that could be used. And you had a, another comment? Yeah, so, so I, I guess uh, there are lots of issues, dimensions to this problem. Uh, as far as science goes, uh, from a totally neutral perspective, I think judges are still out there about the effects of uh, clear, clearing the forest. Uh, so if you go to really extreme, cut every single tree in the entire watershed, and then it's pretty clear, but then you know, the, the companies are not that you know, the, uh, extreme. So uh, as far as science goes, based on Aldis's work and others' work in Canada and elsewhere, uh, so we still have a lot of things that we don't know. S um, so that's science part, and then there's the other part, you know, emotional side and all those. And so that's something I cannot comment. 
Well, I think there's some other common sense issues. Uh, for either Lethbridge or Calgary, the biggest cost of water treatment is uh, getting rid of the silt. So if you're going to cut some steep watersheds in the headwaters and generate a lot of silt, you pay for it not only by losing the forest, you pay for it in your water treatment. So I, I think there's a few jurisdictions. <clears throat> the one that comes to mind is the city of Portland, Oregon. You do not even go walking in the watershed that they rely on for water. You not only can't cut trees, you can't go there and walk. Uh, it's protected for drinking water. They don't have to treat it very much. They add a tiny little bit of residual chlorine to make sure that it's protected in the pipes in case it gets cross-contaminated with sewage pipes or something, but that's it. And uh, to them, it makes economic sense. I'd say to the, the one answer from the David Suzuki Foundation that I would give to that question is to start organizing with your neighbors. Uh, it sounds like they're exhausted and organized, so it's, it's not news that you need to know. Uh, from me at that basic level, but I really, you know, I really do emphasize over and over again that these decisions ultimately are decisions of the public at some level until the land becomes private and out of our hands, I suppose, but um, it is challenging to mount that defense when you've got science that's not 100% certain and you can get accused of just being emotional or of just being um, reactionary, but I would say that Part of the problem is that sort of single issue focus. What's this doing to the water? Well, maybe not that much, but then David mentioned some other things, the siltation, the costs, the forest and the habitat that that provides. Um, I, I think people vastly underestimate the value of the services that intact natural systems provide to them. Uh, I think, you know, the watershed example that David gave, uh, the city of Vancouver has protected its watersheds. You cannot get into them without the permission of the Greater Vancouver Regional District. Uh, the city of New York bought huge chunks of the Adirondack watershed because they knew it would be cheaper than building all the water treatment plants they needed. Uh, these are kind of easy to throw out and hard to use in a situation that's advanced as far as this one sounds like it has. Um, but if there's people who are in the middle or on the fence or haven't quite decided yet, trying to draw a lot of these things together and attack it from multiple angles. Um, I just heard a really fascinating uh, story about uh, alternative energy movement in the United States. And in the, the prairie farming, what we call the Midwest in the U.S., they have convinced people to go for alternative energy power on a freedom from the federal government kind of approach, like, why let the government sell you your power, make your own? Um, sorry, that's home turf for me. Uh, so it's incredible how you can find the commonality with people. Uh, sometimes it takes getting into conversations with people that you don't think you're going to have anything in common with. That's the only other thing that I would uh, suggest on that front. Uh, we had another comment or question back, oh, sorry, back in the back, a new questioner. Thank you. Uh -oh. And you brought up the example of Portland, and I am aware of what's happened in Vancouver, New York. I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a part of a stewardship group in Calgary, um, watershed or a portion of it. Many times uh, over the past 30 years, I've been in meetings where we brought in all three levels of government, sometimes four First Nations have been there. And we would designate uh, half a day for uh, discussion of a certain issue, usually water use, but sometimes matters such as whether or not power vehicles should be on the river and that kind of thing. And we found that we would spend 90% of the time talking about jurisdiction, hmm. almost no time talking about solutions. Uh, regularly after those are over, we would sit down and talk about how we would restructure things to make it easier for those of us who are aimed in certain directions to to influence what happens in our own watersheds. And they almost always end up with watershed authority of one sort or another, river authorities, watershed authority. And what Portland, Vancouver, and New York have done is buy their way into that sort of thing. In Eastern Canada, there are examples of some authorities with some authority. Yep. But we see that as being the, a possibility for local action which actually takes into account the realities of how 
watersheds work. So I'm, I'm just wondering if there's anything new in the science today or even the politics today that we could ba basically aim at. Uh, we need a starting point that goes beyond complaining, uh, goes beyond raising the issues. You, I've been to meetings with several of you before and you've raised these issues very competently. Um, you've been able to bring yourselves out in the press. It doesn't seem to matter. Um, I'm looking for some other way to do it and I'm hoping that there are some other solutions. Well, first, if I could ask any of the panelists to comment on the, the functionality, the likelihood of watershed authorities in, in the Alberta context. Well, we, we do have, well, we, we do have watershed authorities of a sort, but they don't have any real legal powers. Uh, 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 our Water for Life policy a number of years ago set up these, water, these watershed authorities, but um, the, wa the watershed councils, and, and some of them are very active and, <coughs> and very effective, but they don't have any real power. They have no real regulatory power or anything, not like some of the watershed authorities in other jurisdictions, even in Canada, like uh, Ontario. Ontario well. And whether this will uh, improve, you know, this is something uh, from a, a talk that I was at not very recently, and um, a lot of you out there will know, will know uh, uh, David Swan, he's a liberal. MLA, and he was in the audience at this at this gathering, and he said, you know, if you, there's a new government with new ideas, it's not, you know, burdened down, laden down with all the ideology and bureaucracy and and memory of the last government, and a lot of the, lot a lot of the, uh, you know, the top level civil servants are retiring, and you know, now is the time he suggested to get these ideas out, and unless the new government, you know, hears about them and is convinced that there's uh, a, a real movement toward, you know, for example, if if if, this, if governance by watersheds authorities can, you know, is a, is a solution to some of our issues, and you can convince this government of it, now is the time to do it, because um, Mr. Swan, Dr. Swan, was say, said, and I think rightfully so, you have about 18 months before. Um, <laughs> before the the, uh, the new government's going to be planning for another election, and then it's not going to do anything controversial. So, um, I, but I think there are opportunities now. Um, I know the government has been involved uh, in reviewing water allocations for and and water governance for some time now, and I, I think it's going to be moving in that direction again. And I, I personally think there is a a large role for um, governance by 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 watershed authorities, and, and th that's, there has to be a, a, real, um, a real role, uh, a meaningful role, and not just, you know, advisory and... Mm. And I think when you are in a moment in time where you have the opportunity to make something like that come forward to the public, this is when you need to really get it well thought out and packaged you need to understand what problems you're trying to solve from your own perspective, but what are the problems you can try to help solve for the provincial government or whatever other government may be looking at how to get out of a particular headache. Um, you're going to have to understand how these conservation authorities, if they're given real legal powers, how will they be financed and how will they be insured against whatever legal actions they may take. These are the, the real stuff of how we govern our society. So I would encourage people with these kind of ideas to start seeking out law experts, to start seeking out pu public policy and kind of public systems management experts and saying, if we were going to propose this to a, a legislator who let's say had a sympathetic ear, how could we put it in front of them in a way where they said, oh, I can work with that, not, oh my God, here's my latest headache. Um, I think in that 18 month window that you may have, that's the kind of approach that I would really recommend taking. And I would also say that our, our Blue Dot volunteers out here may be the kind of place where you can find some, some support for getting that message out to the public in a way that says, hey, this is a positive way for us to be Albertans, to take charge of something that's been bedeviling our province for a long time, and to create some positive solutions. I think you do have a moment. I think you've got a government that has some pretty hefty priorities on their plate already, phasing out coal, becoming a climate leader, trying to figure out how to manage 
the oil sands extraction industry. But water has been on the Calgary or on the Alberta agenda as a major issue for a long time. And a creative set of solutions that have real world workability uh, might be welcome at this point. I don't know that for a fact, but it might be. One, one mechanism that I've been part of just in the last few years that has been pretty effective are these Rosenberg forums. So, uh, in the most recent one, which was not under this government, it was under the Prentice mm. government, was getting a water quality and quantity agreement between Alberta and Northwest Territories. Mm. If you would have talked two years ago to any Alberta politician or bureaucrat, you would have said that won't happen. No way. But it did happen. Mm. I guess, uh, you know, negotiating uh, water rights between Israel and Palestine and so on is a good warm up for Canadian provinces. Start with the simple stuff and build from there. That's what I always say. We have a couple more questions. One more question. And then we can go out to where the cookies and the coffee. Okay, so we had one more. Kirsten, you've got the microphone allocated. All right. So, uh, yeah, just a, First a in time. A, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. I was just making a bad water policy joke. This had nothing to do with you. My apologies. <laughs> So to address uh, a little bit about the uh, forestry issue, because I'm from the Crow's Nest Pass for the most of the last 10 years, and we've had quite an issue down there. And we created an art project called Red Alert for Water uh, mm. com, and there's a link on that that might be of interest to you, where it talks about the deforestation rates in uh, Alberta are higher than anywhere else in the world, and that's a study that was put out between the by the University of uh, Maryland and they partnered up with Google Earth to watch uh, deforestation rates. And mm. uh, so Canada's rate of deforestation is higher than, any, uh, higher than Russia, higher than Brazil, uh, and most of that is happening on the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains. And most of that is uh, due to industrial purposes. So I think you know, we, we need to put those uh, statistics right in front of our government uh, as, as forcefully as possible. And, and then the, uh, to the uh, a previous comment that thinking about, uh, thinking proactively, um, there are there are studies out there that say that, uh, and this always gets a laugh, but hemp produces as much fiber in a very short period of time as as our forests do. So the equation is much about uh, one acre of forest uh, takes about a hundred years to grow, and one acre of hemp takes 120 days to grow. And you know why why is this not part of our conversation, part of our media? I think we need to keep putting. There's one hemp plant that is being uh, started up in uh, Lethbridge. Uh, it's opening this year. And I think it's costing about five dollars, five million dollars to to set it up. You know, these these things are not in our newspapers, and it is information that does need to get circulated further. And then I have one question just regarding water, and we, maybe we can talk about it at the back. But is that uh, when the Na Navigable Waters Act was rescinded, uh, October 2012? Um, I just I just want to know if that's as serious as, as it came across in the press or if, and if that's something that should be put back in place or if it was less of an issue than, I mean, I, I just don't <coughs> understand it, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say, and I would appreciate your uh, comments on it. Yeah, I can't really quantify how much an issue it is. It's very difficult to, 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 to you know, really ascertain the real difference on, and, and on in, in the world, but it went from the Navigable Waters Protection Act, so it was the waters that mm -hmm. were protected, to the Navigation <coughs> Protection Act. You know, so it went from protecting the navigable waters to protection protecting the navigation. So the government, the federal government, you know, even by that, you know, sort of took itself out of protecting the waters, and then it, it made it, the, the the changes in 2012 also made it, you know, very discretionary on, on the government as to when it will um, like require an environmental assessment or even an approval under the Navigable Navigation Protection Act. Um, but there is a, a very good article by uh, Professor Martin Olzinski at the University of Calgary. If you just, <laughs> just Google Olzinski, right? I can tell you how to spell it later. I'm Kwasniak, I can say that. Uh, but um, on, on the on-the-ground differences that the changes to the Fisheries Act mm -hmm. made. I mean, he did a lot of empirical research, and he's a, a, a lawyer and, ac and academic, on, on the, you know, because there are lots of changes to the Fisheries Act as well. And um, 
and and he's he has been able to conclude that uh, that there has been um, uh, empirical changes in the protection levels of, of our fisheries in Canada due to those changes. I can sort of answer that a little bit as well if you want yes. to go ahead first. Go ahead. It, what, 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 you go ahead and say what you're going to say, and I'll okay. follow on. Okay. We'll yeah. Um, yes. It. Well, what it does, it um, um, the Fisheries Act changes in conjunction with the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act changes. You know, will um, you know make uh, the provincial assessments substitute for the federal ones, and also you know extremely reduce the number of assessments because. Before it was really any time um, any project might affect federal jurisdiction over fisheries or uh, uh, other other things that there was federal jurisdiction, there was a possibility of having an environmental assessment before a federal approval would be issued. But now instead of that kind of wide open um, uh, possibility for assessment, now it's just you know is it on a list? And so if it's not on the list, it's very unlikely there's going to be a, an assessment. Well, in the fisheries side, they removed all of the habitat provisions, and they fired all the habitat biologists. So there's no habitat arm of the Department of Fisheries. And the protection is so-called CRA species. If they're not part of a commercial, recreational, or aboriginal fishery, they're not protected. And that can be the same species in a remote area where nobody's fishing for it, or in areas where there are people who fish for those valuable species that totally disregards the non-commercial and, and non-subsistence fisheries that those other fish rely on, things like minnows and so on. So Even lobsters used to be considered stupid. trash fish. It's no other word. It's just yeah. bad science. Yeah, I would just say that uh, I think Arlene captured it. The main effect of many of those changes, the Navigable Waters Protection Act, basically from the time Canada started, if you could, could float a canoe in it, it was potentially navigable, so protect those waters. But it is that, it's the, the concept is the trigger. Many, many things that would have been covered under those acts would trigger an environmental assessment at the federal level, which would then require a whole bunch of other work. Uh, now all those triggers are gone. And so nothing gets, or very few things get assessed compared to what we used to have. So anyway, I want to ask all of you to uh, join me in thanking our panelists and yourselves for being here tonight. <laughs> and uh, thanks again to the Royal Canadian Institute and the RBC Blue Water Project. And we have some snacks out in the lobby, uh, some coffee and cookies. And if you'd like to stick around and talk a little more, look at the blue dot table, uh, speak to any of us, we'd be happy to speak with you for a little while longer until they boot us out into the cold. Good night.